And uh, you all, I think most of you are familiar enough with how we do things that you're welcome to use that chat and say hi, uh, tell us where you're viewing from, all that good stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and get us started for the evening. I'm Kelly Hancock. I'm the Director of Programs at the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia. But we also have our sites in Appomattox and manage the White House of the Confederacy. So we've got three sites. And you all know that I start out with announcements because we've got a lot going on. In fact, in uh, just a few weeks, we have our uh, largest event of the year, our annual symposium on February 18th. We'll be looking at the Civil War and Remaking America. We've got a great of scholars lined up, Vanessa Sinha, Andrew Lang, Aaron Sheehan Dean, Kate Mazur, and Carrie Janey will be uh, joining us to talk about uh, the Civil War and how it remade America. And uh, this symposium will be launching a multi year initiative where we'll have programs and exhibits uh, outlining the causes, course, and consequences of the American Civil War. So we'll be following this symposium up with lecture series, and you can find more information about uh, our upcoming programs at our website, acwm.org. A few, uh, one thing to mention about the symposium, even though it's in person and we're encouraging people to come on site and see us, we do have a live stream available of that. So you can register to see the symposium from your home uh, for $35 for the live stream. And uh, if you come in person, it's either 75 or if you're a member, it's $50. So this is a great time to become a member if you're not already one, because not only will you be supporting all the great work that we're doing at the museum, uh, you'll get a good discount. Now, virtual programs, uh, we do have another one for the month of February. In honor of Black History Month, we are partnering with the Medal of Honor Museum and uh, doing a program, Boys, the Old Flag Never Touched the Ground, honoring Sergeant William Carney. So we'll be speaking with folks from uh, the Medal of Honor Museum. And then on March 2nd, we'll have our next book talk, and uh, that will be with Pat Brennan. He'll be talking about his uh, latest Gettysburg in Color, Volume 1, Brandy Station to the Peach Orchard. So a lot, a uh, lot to, to see and attend. Now for tonight, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our guest authors. Uh, we have with us Chris Mikowski, who is the Editor-in-Chief and the co-founder of Emerging Civil War and the managing editor of the Emerging Civil War series published by Savas Beatty. Chris is a writing professor in the Jandoli School of Communication at St. Bonaventure University, where he also serves as the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs and the Historian in Residence at Stevenson Ridge, a historic property on the Spotsylvania Courthouse battlefield. And uh, joining him is Frank Caturo, who is an attorney and author. His previous writings include President Grant Reconsidered, 1998, and the Supreme Court's Retreat from Reconstruction, published in 2000. He is also the president of the Grant Monument Association, which is dedicated to the preservation of Grant's tomb. Frank served as the counsel for the Constitution for the Senate Judiciary Committee and as special counsel to the House Select Investigative Panel. He currently serves as vice president and senior counsel of the Judicial Crisis Network. So without further ado, I am going to turn the screen over to our guest authors and uh, let them uh, take it away. Huzzah! Very good. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being with us tonight. Kelly, thank you so much for having us. It's always a treat to help out the museum. Um, just the, the work that you guys are doing is fantastic, and I can't say enough good things about it. Um, I am going to paste in here, uh, since Kelly started out with commercials, I'll start out with my own. If you're interested in a copy of the book, I've just posted the link to Savas Beatty. Uh, you can order the book there. They've got a special going on right now that 
you can make me wrap up a book and send it to you directly if you order before Tuesday. And Frank and I have signed them both. Uh, but I will also point out that if you order the book through the museum, any purchases that you make through the, the museum help to support the museum. So I also want to just put that plug in there too, because um, you know the bookstore helps with those operations, helps subsidize what's going on there at the museum and the programming that they're able to bring to you. So thanks for being with us tonight. Um, the way Frank and I have sort of talked about structuring this is I'm going to lob a few questions to him. That's going to get the conversation going. And uh, we're going to chat back and forth and you get to eavesdrop on us a little bit. But we also want you to put your questions in the chat box so that we can come back to those as we circle around toward the end of the conversation and get your thoughts and comments and questions involved as well. Um, uh, Frank is one of my Civil War superheroes because, um, and you can't say this about too many people, but I will say this about Frank, who virtually single-handedly helped turn around the sad fate of Ulysses S. Grant in his final resting place in New York City. Um, so I think we should all give him a, a, a round of applause for that because Grant's tomb today is a marvelous place to visit and we wouldn't have it as the beautiful resource we have today if it wasn't for Frank's conscientious work. So Frank, maybe for those who aren't familiar with that story, uh, maybe that's a good place for us to start because that's really kind of what brought the two of us together on this project, the work that you did at Grant's tomb. Sure, thank you, Chris. And well, let me begin by uh, thanking Kelly and the American Civil War Museum for hosting us tonight. It is so nice to be with you. Uh, glad we can be together uh, virtually uh, through the change of you know circumstances over the last couple of years. This is one small silver uh, lining is that we're able to do programs like this and have people from all across the country uh, take part. Uh, I want to add my own kudos to uh, to all of you at the museum for what you've uh, done to make it a first rate operation and also to convey what an honor it is to uh, share a book with uh, Chris Mikowski, who is uh, such a fantastic historian and uh, uh, someone who's involved with scholarship, someone who uh, both teaches and is involved with you know, the scholarship on just about every uh, level, and not to mention someone who, better than anyone alive, I think, can explain to a general audience Civil War battles, what happened, how they operated, the dynamics of leadership. Uh, so it's really a pleasure being with all of you. And I do want to uh, also add my thanks to all the contributors to our book who pitched uh, essays. This goes to my answer to Chris's question about the story of Grant's tomb, because you know, these contributors agreed uh, not to take royalties for their work, but for the proceeds of the book um, to go to two organizations. One is the Ulysses S. Grant Association, the nonprofit that runs the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library, and that had earlier uh, edited and published Grant's papers. And the other is the Grant Monument Association. And of course, when you buy through the museum, they'll also get a cut. So it is uh, a very charitable uh, endeavor uh, when you make a book purchase. Uh, you're supporting the cause uh, as well as hopefully uh, enriching yourself and uh, furthering uh, you know, your own scholarly uh, pursuits. So Grant's tomb, uh, I crossed paths with the monument when I started dorming at college a few blocks away from the tomb at uh, Columbia on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in the fall of 1990, in fact. Uh, I anticipated a pretty benign stint as a neighborhood tour guide and had been interested in Grant. I delved into his life and his career, I actually had a particular interest in his presidency that really uh, blew up between like the seventh and eighth grade. And it was just a happy coincidence that I wound up at a school that was near Grant's final resting place. But never did I anticipate that there would be really a historic preservation component to this experience. Because soon after I began volunteering and giving tours, it became clear that the monument was in bad shape. It was being desecrated, vandalized. It was there spray paint graffiti. There were uh, homeless who were doing drugs and using the site as a bathroom and shelter on a virtually daily basis. 
And there are other forms of disrespectful activity also that happened on a, a sporadic occasions. It really just about every form of disrespectful conduct you can imagine from apparent prostitution to Santeria, what we think were Santeria rituals when we found you know, slaughtered chickens uh, outside the, uh, the monument. And then there was the the monument itself that was not having basic maintenance needs taken care of. Because, you know, even apart from desecration and neglect, every structure, just like personal homes, for those of you who are homeowners, you know that the roof has to be changed every X number of years and all sorts of maintenance needs will come up. And well, those were not being taken care of. And on top of everything else, the park service, which took over the monument in 1959 had a history of mishandling uh, our, and, and in some cases intentionally destroying features of the site and its accompanying archival collection. So I, as I was discovering these things, I sort of butted my head against a bureaucratic wall for about two and a half years, working up the chain of command in the National Park Service bureaucracy, trying to see if we can get some corrective action. And ultimately, unfortunately, uh, found myself confronting them and with a whistleblowing report after there was no progress that was made. And, and frankly, Park Service supervisors at the time actually threatened those of us on staff with reprisals if we went public with what was going on at the site. So that's why this step of uh, whistleblowing had to take place, um, reaching out to going to the news media and, and to public officials from the president on down. And surely enough, the congressional delegation stepped up. There was a bipartisan effort to increase funds to the monument to uh, get the resources out there that the Park Service needed to refurbish the monument in time for its centennial in 1997. Now, to further this cause, we got together a nonprofit, it was incorporated in 1994, but we like to say it was really revived as a successor in interest to a group of the same name. The Grant Monument Association was established immediately after Grant's death in 1885 as a conduit to raise funds and ultimately to care for Grant's tomb. Well, that original Grant Monument Association had a declining membership and an aging leadership in the mid 20th century. The tomb, as I mentioned, had to be turned over to the National Park Service. Fortunately, they did have uh, that government entity there to uh, to come in, even though for many years they, uh, they were struggling to really get their act together. Well, we thought uh, a Grant Monument Association should be revived as a an ongoing outlet for concerned citizens something of a watchdog group for the National Park Service to make sure that earlier problems did not recur. But then over the years, as the personnel of the Manhattan Sites Unit of the National Park Service changed, we found to our delight that our relationship became much more collaborative. It had initially in the 90s been almost entirely confrontational. And it reached a point that in recent years, we have worked closely together on uh, developing historical programming, commemorative programming uh, at Grant's tomb. Grant's birthday was an event that had regularly been observed every year by the Park Service and West Point. But there are other uh, observances that now take place, Anniver other anniversaries like Grant's death and, and his wife Julia's birth and death milestone anniversaries, like the 150th anniversary of Appomattox, uh, Lee's surrender at Appomattox in, in 2015, or the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 15th Amendment in 2020. So we, we have uh, been able to uh, work with uh, the Park Service on all of these fronts, the commemorative front, while still pushing for the tomb's refurbishment. And by the way, it, I, I don't want to make it sound as if uh, the situation is all rosy because there are recurring maintenance issues that have come up. And while not as pronounced as they were in the 1990s, uh, the agency has been slower to take care of them, uh, to address them. Um, this despite uh, 
the Great American Outdoors Act that Congress passed in 2020, which creates a multi-billion dollar fund to take care of national parks, well, not a nickel of that has yet gone to Grant's tomb. Like a lot of smaller urban national parks, it still has something of a stepchild status within the National Park Service. And so we're hoping to raise more attention to the ongoing needs of that site and hopefully get some uh, uh, bonuses uh, in place in terms of uh, improvements, maybe get a more ample visitor center in place so that people can be taught this story of an American leader who was just so instrumental, so uh, centrally important to America's story. Now, I'm a big believer in the power of place to help uh inspire people, connect people to their history. So, so Frank, obviously your long association with the tomb has connected you with the story of Grant in ways that probably you never would have expected at first. Um, what have you learned about Grant by being so connected to him through this very special place? Well, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, um, First, when you, I think anyone who's been a tour guide at any historical museum, whether it's a monument or another a historic uh, site, will learn a lot about um, people of all different stripes and what Americans have on their minds about their heritage. And over the years, it's quite interesting how you can see the changing focus that people had when they talked about the Civil War, how as recently as 1990, you know, the early 1990s, Grant still seemed in many ways to be a sectional figure for a lot of people. So he was the Northern guy and Lee had not yet shed his sort of demigod status, his, you know, consummate uh, uh, American you know, folk hero status that that he had. You know, there was kind of a switching around of their historical places where Lee had been the sectional guy. There was not really a, any dispute about that during the two men's lifetimes, and Grant was the national figure. And over uh, over the years, uh, you know, I, I've found that people have much more of an awareness of Grant's career beside beyond be, the what would people know from their history books, which, okay, yes, he was the supreme commander of the Union armies, the one who basically helped the Union win the Civil War more than any other military figure. Uh, but in the course of, you know, working there and then dealing with the Grant Monument Association, yeah, there were some interesting people that I got to cross paths with. And one of the first in this category I would identify as Ulysses Grant Dietz, a great, great grandson he and his cousin, uh, Claire, uh, both uh, great-great-grandchildren, they were, their contact information was in the Rolodex of Grant's tomb. Uh, the National Park Service had their contact information along with the information about their mothers, who were both great-granddaughters, of course. And these uh, wonderful uh, ladies, uh, Clara Rusto and uh, Julia Dietz, uh, it was a real privilege to get to know them in their last years uh, and to get a sense, of, besides really being uh, just, they're, they're very charming people to know, just to sit down with, to spend some time with them. But it also really struck me how little time has passed, how close we are to the Civil War when you look at these living links because uh, these great granddaughters knew, even if only in passing, even if they didn't get to spend much time with two of Grant's four children, whose lifespans overlapped theirs, uh, their their own uh, great grandfather, their own grandfather, excuse me, was Ella Hugh Root, whose daughter Edith married Ulysses S. Grant III, and they knew their their grandfather, Root, who lived into the late 1930s. And there's another profoundly important uh, historical uh, figure. And of course, their own father, Ulysses S. Grant III, lived until 1968. He was four years old at the time his famous grandfather died. He was at that 
cottage at the Grand Cottage uh, uh, depicted you know, right behind uh, Chris uh, tonight um, and remembered uh, the time that he spent with his uh, famous grandfather. Well, Claire and Ulysses uh, also remember their grandfather because he lived a good long life. So you have descendants who are around today who knew intimately people who were part of Grant's own intimate circle, his family during his lifetime. That I found remarkable, uh, as, as, as was uh, the introduction to a man named Oren Root, who was a relative of Elihu Root, uh, although he's not uh, one of the, not uh, uh, related to uh, the Grants other than uh, a collateral descent from uh, Elihu Root. But Oren Root was the last surviving member of the original Grant Monument Association and someone with a really interesting history that started out when he was a young, just out of law school, started basically a signature campaign to try to get Wendell Wilkie to run for president. Well, I got to meet uh, Mr. Root in his last years, and he imparted his blessing, so to speak, on what we were doing to revive the old Grant Monument Association. Of course, the family got on board as well. They were really supportive. And so those, I mean, I could probably write a whole volume on interesting people I've crossed paths with over the course of uh, my experience with Grant's tomb. I've basically just told you about uh, people I met between 1992 and 94, and you see how much time that filled up. <laughs> In the 30 years, I can't believe it's like 30 years since uh, uh, we were working to get the GMA incorporated. Um, there are just so many other people I've had uh, the privilege of, of meeting, and it's become an annual ritual to meet whoever uh, West Point sends. It's it's always a general. It's often the, the commandant, if not the uh, superintendent uh, there, uh, who helps commemorate Grant's uh, birthday. And then in recent years, we were connected thanks to the secretary of the Grant Monument Association, Ed Hockman, who I have to give a shout out to. He has been there from the beginning and he's been so dedicated and so selfless uh, in the work that he's done. Start, he, he is an attorney who first reached out to me when he read about the travails of Grant's tomb to see if he could offer any legal help. And he actually filed a pro bono lawsuit uh, against everyone from the Secretary of the Interior on down, you know, the chain of command of the National Park Service to try to compel them to restore Grant's tomb. We wound up withdrawing that complaint without prejudice after the government did act when all of these congressional funds uh, you know, followed. Uh, but Ed connected us with someone that a few of you might have heard of, a general named David Petraeus. Uh, he, we decided in 2015 to do a dinner marking the 150th anniversary of Lee's surrender. We thought it would be a one-time thing, but discovered in the process that General Petraeus is a bona fide Grant fan, besides being a really nice guy and a really generous guy. Um, well, he wanted to come back, basically has come back every year to do programs. And we realized that being the case, let's do something that the original Grant Monument Association did. I wasn't sure if this would be possible. Let's revive the tradition of marking Grant's birthday with a dinner. Uh, back in the 1890s, there were actually different, more than one group uh, was, was out there in New York City alone planning Grant birthday dinners. But eventually, one of these groups, which was known as the Grant Birthday Association, was folded into the Grant Monument Association. And starting in 1898, into some I don't know exactly when in the early 20th century the tradition probably dissipated because I've not seen quite the what what the record was when it ended. This would happen every year. There would be a dinner. And we're continuing now every year to hold these dinners uh, on or very close to Grant's birthday that last week in April. And of course, that becomes an opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people. General Petraeus. The, the format that's developed is he will interview a different Grant historian uh, every time uh, his guests have include Joan Waugh, who I know has been a guest of the uh, museum. 
for Grant's 200th birthday, he jointly interviewed Ron Chernow and Ron White, both of whom wrote very impressive uh, bi recent biographies of Grant. Uh, Brooks Simpson, who is maybe the greatest living expert on Grant, has been so prolific over the last 40 years writing about that period and, and a lot about Grant specifically. He's going to be the, the colloquy guest uh, for this year's dinner, which is actually going to fall on April 24th, three days before Grant's uh, birthday. So besides the name dropping, I'll put that plug in for this upcoming uh, uh, event. Speaking of name dropping, though, you've dropped several names of contributors to our book. And I want to kind of back up on that a little bit because uh, you mentioned Ulysses, uh, Ulysses Grant Dietz, who contributed a wonderful essay to our book that talks about what it's like to live in the shadow of this famous ancestor. And one of my favorite pictures in the whole book is something I've posted in the chat there. And uh, Ulysses was kind enough to share a picture of him and his grandfather, Ulysses S. Grant III, uh, sitting on a porch. Um, and, uh, and to me, that's just really kind of captures what, what Frank was saying earlier about how close we are still to the Civil War, and we have these connections that can take us backwards and backwards. Um, you'd also mentioned Joan Waugh, who has a, a great piece in the book as well. I'm going to go through this list of contributors just to make sure that we get um, mentions of everybody. And when I get to Ben Kemp, who's been doing wonderful service for us, posting other pictures in the chat, we can all give him a special thank you. Uh, Charles Calhoun, uh, Al Felsenberg, Kurt Fields, Gary Gallagher, Ben Kemp, um, John Marzalek, Nick Sacco, uh, Ryan Sems, Tim Smith, Joan Waugh, Frank White, and Frank J. Williams. Uh, plus, we've got um, a contribution from Jack Kemp, the former um, HUD secretary. And there are letters from each of the six living presidents that are in our book, which I thought was a really cool snag. Um, Frank, Lots to talk about there as far as our who's who of contributors, a real A list of historians. But how did we end up getting the presidents to contribute to the book? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. And I think it's something that would not have happened if we were talking about a grant anniversary 50 years ago, 75 years ago. Now, in the late 19th century, sure. Every living president attended Grant's funeral. You could not stay away from Grant's funeral. Every living president, in fact, had something to do with the Grant Monument Association, with the construction of his tomb. Two of the three living presidents were there at the dedication of his tomb in 1897. But then after a visit by William Taft uh, in, the year, in 1908, while he's running for president, the records of presidential connections to Grant's tomb kind of drops off precipitously. And I think it's a it's really a reflection of Grant's evolving reputation and also our changing understanding of his era, particularly the post-war era that's undergone such dramatic uh, reassessment, reconstruction I'm talking about in particular, but also other surrounding issues from the post-war per period. We got all six of these presidents, obviously, you're talking about people from both parties to contribute. And of course, the, the actual effort of getting them to do that was starting early. And then when you, you get a few of them snagged, you, I'll let you in on some inside, you know, uh, uh, tactics here is you let the other offices know, hey, you know, this, we've, we've got a couple presidents here. It's, why, why not make it unanimous, right? Um, Jimmy Carter, the earliest uh, living uh, president, uh, his presidency slightly overlaps Grant's by exactly 100 years because Carter's first a little more than a, a month or month and a half or so overlaps the last month and a half of Grant's uh, president by, presidency by 100 years between 1877 and 1977. And Carter's letter was really, uh, it was interesting because he starts off with how, as a boy growing up in Georgia, I was not taught to admire Union General Ulysses S. Grant. But then he explains how in later years he learned to appreciate him. And all six presidents, all six presidents spoke of Grant as a unifying figure, and all six of them paid tribute to his legacy advancing equal rights. That's another thing. I just don't think it was on the radar 
of presidents, of people on that level 50 years ago, 75 years ago, uh, even for presidents who were in many ways advancing aspects of Grant's legacy. I mean, Harry Truman uh, did not have kind things to say about Grant. He was a bit of an amateur presidential historian, but his views largely reflected those of most historians of the period. But this was someone who took a courageous stand to at least start the ball rolling again in the mid 20th century to desegregate the uh, military. You know, he could have appreciated an aspect of Grant's presidency that I think was just a, a gaping blind spot, but no longer. And that's one, one thing that I think having the six presidents participating uh, reflects. And of course not, I think very few presidents would have uh, evoked this sort of response from them. And I think that ties back to a comment you made earlier about, uh, you know, Grant seen sort of as a, a sectional figure, not a national figure, as his reputation has shifted over time. And I, and I think about, you know, as he's on the porch at Grant Cottage finishing his memoirs and he's talking to his son and he says that he's probably done more in dying to bring the country together than most people had done as they were alive. And he saw himself as a unifying figure because of the outpouring of support people gave to him in his dying months. And north and south, um, poor and rich, and um, you know, so so to again kind of see that f come full circle and see him as a unifying figure today, um, to me, it's like a direct connection to that legacy that he he literally hoped that he was leaving. Um, he says in the dedication to his memoirs that he dedicates the book to soldiers north and south, not just soldiers of the north, because of that that notion of unity. So I really kind of like that that thread that comes through, and the way we we pull that together in the book. I take it that was an inspiration too uh, when you wrote your own book about Grant's final days. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm a writer who wrote a book about a dude writing a book, which is a really nerdy kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it was just a wonderful uh, story to tell. Um, and, you you know, no Hollywood script writer could get away with that. And uh, in my own um, introduction to Grant at 200, I sort of set the introduction in those moments as he's trying to struggle with being a writer and he's worried about punctuation and spelling and fact checking and all those things that we as writers have to deal with on a daily basis. And, and he's not someone that we tend to remember in that way. And to kind of see him struggling with the same sorts of things that I as a writer struggle with was uh, just a, a wonderful, uh, insightful experience for me to go through. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the pieces that we pulled together um, really shed light on aspects of his life that people might not consider, might not have thought of him in that way, um, you know, and kind of help you know, peel back the veil on this historical figure that we tend to remember as the guy in the $50 bill, and maybe that's all. Um, there's so much more to him than that. So, Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Ben Kemp is with us. He wrote a wonderful piece, uh, and this kind of ties back to something I mentioned earlier about the power of place to help connect us. He wrote a wonderful connection about if you go to Grant Cottage, um, how does that help you connect with the story to walk in those footsteps? It's literally Grant's final footsteps. Um, how does that help connect you to place? And what does that help Ben as a historian learn about um, Grant as a figure? I saw in the chat earlier, someone said that they planned to go to Grant Cottage later this summer. Um, I can't recommend the site highly enough it's just a wonderful poignant place to go and uh, sit in that same porch where grant sat and and there are those sorts of ways that you can connect to this story that really bring it out and bring it to life too so um frank as we were pulling together this collection uh and again as i said lots of different topics and lots of different ways to look at grant um was there anything that was particularly surprising to you or a light bulb moment as you read somebody's work well, I'll tell you, uh, there was so much, of course, that the various essays uh, offer, not to mention the research that I did for my own uh, uh, chapters uh, in the book, um, which are dedicated to Grant's presidential standing and then uh, to Grant's tomb. But, uh, you know, there are a couple of our uh, authors, Nick Sacco and Ulysses Dietz, brought some really interesting extra dimensions to the story of Grant's family life. Um, they both presented pictures of Grant's, well, I mean, Ulysses takes Grant's family up to the 
present generation. Obviously, it's a brief overview with the time, with, with the space that's allocated uh, to him. But he goes back to the St. Louis years when where the children were born. And well, Nick's contribution, for those of you who don't know, uh, Nick is uh, a ranger who helps lead the interpretive uh, effort at Grant's home in St. Louis, what we call Whitehaven, but what is officially known as the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic uh, Site. He's an, uh, a superb historian who has written quite a lot, and I'm really glad that he was willing to uh, help us out here with his contribution, which helped break the whole, the, the old paradigm. It's it's so easy to get caught up in cliches or oversimplifications about not only uh, the main character of Ulysses, but also the people who surrounded him. So they're, they're, in some circles, you'll see, you know, Grant's family, uh, his, his parents are the anti-slavery people. Julia's parents are the slaveholders. One side's good, one side's bad, one side's mean, one side's... And what you actually uh, get from Nick's account, and this is consistent with uh, Ulysses' uh, own account, is just what a warm relationship Grant had with his in-laws. And Nick, I think, brings out in, in many ways, uh, there was more warmth there than was expressed by, you know, from the Grant uh, household, even though they had... Uh, a position that aligned with you know, Grant as the ultimate emancipator. And of course, that's a position that uh, has been on the side of history, as they say. But you see there are so many different dimensions of people who are, who are involved. Also, another thing about the St. Louis years that Ulysses brought out, those years in St. Louis, when Grant was economically down on his luck. He had to peddle firewood in the streets of St. Louis uh, just to help make a living. Of course, this is during the Panic of 1857. The, the entire nation is suffering. But Ulysses points out that, you know, these years were among the happiest in Grant's life, that uh, his children never wanted for anything, even during this period, and that they had only the happiest of memories of those reputedly hard times. So those uh, those are a couple of really interesting uh, observations that uh, could come as a surprise. I, I know Ron White. I also want to. I, I'm not going to be doing justice to our contributors because there's so much. We have you know, like a dozen writers that I can talk about here, uh, besides you, Chris. Uh, but Ron White has one. I do want to make some mention uh, of this. He wrote an essay called "Son of Methodism" about Grant's religiosity. Uh, it's an important biographical uh, topic uh, because there are a lot of, in recent works on Grant, uh, they tend to talk little about his religious life. Uh, and Grant was not uh, someone who uh, wore, who, who was very demonstrative that he wore uh, faith on his sleeve. But when you actually look at the record, you look at his lifelong participation in Methodist churches and his appreciation of Methodist ministers, which Ron really breaks down in this uh, essay. He also talks about what Grant ex explicitly had to say about scripture. If you look at his correspondence with uh, Chautauqua, uh, 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 being uh, uh, set up, um, Ron uh, concludes that Grant really was someone who, uh, at his core, was uh, a, a, an active Methodist and one in the, uh, whose faith was deeply held. Uh, and he points to traits that were widely acknowledged, like his magnanimity and his self-effacement, his continuing ability to give credit to others. By the way, a lot of these are traits that were also uh, abundantly uh, uh, present in Grant's mother, uh, Hannah, who was uh, a devout Methodist. Um, well, for Ron, this uh, contributed to uh, a, a religious component uh, of, of Grant's makeup that just uh, doesn't come out in a lot of the other studies. Now, his wonderful American Ulysses does talk about this. It actually brings out this aspect of Grant, but in this essay, he actually brings out even more detail. And I hope it'll be 
one of those topics that really uh, triggers some uh, changing of, of, of in the views of, of Grant, because there are a number of people who thought that Grant was you know, basically completely irreligious and even a closet agnostic. And I think that's belied by the sort of uh, ex discoveries that um, and, and writing that uh, Ron White just did. Now, uh, in my own research for the presidency uh, chapter, which is called President Grant Belongs in the Pantheon, I talk about his presidential standing. A lot of the essay is about Grant's relationship to historians, how historians have handled Grant over the years. And I was familiar with a bit of this story because you almost can't explore Grant historiography without being struck by the 180 degree turn from when Reconstruction was lambasted as this horrible thing, employing you know, racialist assumptions about former slaves not being equipped to be citizens and what a mistake it was to give them the right to vote and how that's changed uh, 180 degrees. Well, one of the, the most interesting of these flip-flops of which I was only partially aware was that of someone who's considered by many to be the greatest historian of the 20th century, C. Van Woodward. Now in 1957, writing for American Heritage Magazine, he described Grant's presidency as presidential statesmanship at its worst. His article was entitled The Lowest Ebb. And when it came to Reconstruction, he depicted Grant as the tool of radical Republicans. He called the radicals extremists and he charged that Grant fell under the influence of these extremists and went over completely to their Southern policy. And then after William, you know, 1970s and 80s come along, 1981, uh, William McFeely comes out with a Grant uh, biography. Woodward pulls an about face attacking Grant for his supposed hostility toward what he called the more radical war aim for black franchise and racial equality. And he blames him for the abandonment of reconstruction. Now that's a, a flip flop of which a number of us were aware. If you, if you read Brooks Simpson, you know about that. Um, Interestingly enough, eight years later, writing about Reconstruction more generally, Woodward threw up his hands and he confessed that he failed to find any satisfactory uh, explanation for the failure of Reconstruction. He invited other historians to seek that answer out. And then about the same time, uh, something that I had no idea of, but I saw this in an edited uh, edition of uh, Woodward's letters that was published a few years ago, Woodward was asked, this comes out in one of the uh, letters, he was asked during the Iran-Contra uh, scandal, uh, 1987, during the Reagan administration, to try to put uh, this administration, what was happening with Iran-Contra into perspective. And he had a really interesting uh, quote, which I'll, I'll actually read part of it to you. He said, given what's happened recently, and granted he was uh, maybe getting a little carried away with what he saw in the late 80s, but this also incorporated what he had seen going back to Watergate when he actually uh, started uh, a, a, a study of presidential corruption uh, a compilation of, of uh, chapters by various historians to kind of survey uh, presidential misconduct. Well, in, in 1987, uh, Woodward said he, he admitted that the old benchmarks of perfidy failed me totally. He said, U.S. Grant, Boss Tweed, Black Friday, Credit Mobile. He goes on with a few of these things. Peanuts, chicken feed, child's play. He said, our prevailing picture of the Gilded Age is preposterous, a howling anachronism. Revision, replacement, vindication, updating, call it what you will, but it is the most pressing duty facing American historians. So Woodward late in life is talking about how images of the Gilded Age that he had contributed to uh, in his 1957 article and elsewhere, were a howling anachronism. They needed to be corrected. 
And I found that really interesting when you explore the odyssey of, uh, of Woodward, which in some ways is a stand-in for the odyssey that the American historical profession has taken and still needs to take before it completely gets the grant presidency right. Uh, now, those of you who follow, I, I, I don't like to give too much credence to uh, presidential uh, greatness uh, surveys because they're kind of silly, let's face it. The whole exercise of rating presidents numerically as if they were term papers when, of course, there's so many different, there, there's so such complexity, there's such differences in the challenges that different presidents uh, faced, and there are some who just did you know more memorable things than uh, than others? Uh, others just didn't have the same opportunities and so forth. But it is really interesting to see that um, Grant, when these presidential surveys first came out, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Uh, pioneered these surveys in 1948 and 1962. Grant came in at second to the bottom, second only to rock bottom Warren Harding among presidential failures. And over the last quarter century, that has really changed. Now, you have others who've gotten into the ratings uh, game, uh, but C-SPAN, maybe most notably, has been doing this uh, during the 21st century. They do another poll every time a new president takes office. And Grant has worked his way up to barely in the top half of uh, presidents. Like He's in the average category, but he winds up being... I think it was maybe number 21 in the last, uh, or 20 or 21. Uh, so maybe one or two up from that, that midpoint uh, among presidents. And that's an interesting, of course, all of this is more of a statement on the American historical profession than it is on the presidents themselves. But what I think this reflects, because this exercise of writing about Grant's presidential standing uh, forced me to really take an accounting of what's been written over the last quarter century in particular, although I certainly look at uh, what came before then, because I wrote a short book, as was mentioned in the introduction about Grant's presidency called President Grant Reconsidered. I wrote that in 1998. I actually wrote it a few years earlier, but it was published in 1998. But it's, there's a, a mind-blowing number of uh, works that have been written since then. I mentioned to you uh, White and Chernow who go into the presidency in, in detail. Uh, no one goes into the presidency in more detail among recent authors than Chuck Calhoun, who I'm so honored that you know we have him as one of our contributors. He's the first person to write a definitive work focused in a definitive narrative focused entirely on Grant's presidency in over eight decades. His book came out in 2017. And so he wrote about Grant as his conception of politics, and he brought in a number of the themes that you find in his longer work that Grant was an effective legislative uh, president. Um, he was uh, someone who was remarkably successful in getting the agenda that he had, not only on Reconstruction, but also in some other areas through uh, Congress. But what I think has been happening with his reputation, you, you can pose the question, well, is going from the bottom to the middle, does that reflect that he's on his way to the top, or has he just kind of floated up to the middle, but then he's, well, we'll let him kind of float in the middle? Um, my sense of this is that his middling rank today reflects that more and more historians are aware of and appreciate what he did for civil rights. At least they appreciate it on some level for voting rights and civil rights, which if you were talking in 19th century idioms, uh, you have to use both of those terms because they're, they're not uh, synonymous. But I don't think that uh, historians have yet come around to appreciate the other aspects of the myths about Grant's presidency, what we'll call the corruption narrative, uh, which I think is really baseless and employs a gross distortion of uh, perspective uh, as compared to other uh, presidencies, but also other domestic and foreign policy uh, achievements on, uh, on Grant's part um, that have 
that that are often ignored. And and you know you can write the difference between now and fifty or seventy five years ago is you can no longer write uh, a summary from twenty thousand feet of Grant's presidency that is all about, oh, corrupt administration, period, or corrupt administration, oppressive reconstruction, and, and, and stop there. Of course, your conception of reconstruction is now different because, as I said before, that's changed 180 degrees. You have to bring that out in any brief synopsis, you know, trying to summarize the big points of Grant's presidency. But the corruption narrative, I think, is still quite prominent. If you were to ask uh, the average uh, student of American history what the second most prominent item was in Grant's uh, presidency, and you can completely ignore a wide array of domestic and foreign policy achievements apart from the Reconstruction category, pretty much with impunity. There are not many people who talk about, for instance, his settlement of the Alabama claims uh, with Great Britain, which was a huge cause of tension, the greatest tension that existed between the United States and Britain since the War of 1812, a really sore point, uh, a dispute that arose from the Civil War, from the, uh, con the destruction that was incurred by Confederate raiders that were built in British shipyards with the British government kind of negligently looking the other way. Um, Grant not only got the Alabama claims successfully arbitrated, but he did so in a way that submitted this to an international tribunal. It also was part of a treaty that he was able to secure called the Treaty of Washington, which one expert in international law called the greatest treaty of immediate uh, uh, arbitration that the world had ever seen. And then he, this writer said in the 1930s, it still holds that distinction. Uh, or you could talk about the Virginia dispute with Spain, where Grant uh, basically averts war at a time when uh, there, there's a ship that's that's seized by the Spanish that was flying the American flag. There were several there were several Americans who were uh, uh, who were killed by Spanish authorities who said that you're you're there to aid Cuban rebels. Well, cooler heads prevailed because of the stand that Grant took with the cooperation of his able Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish. And so it would be another quarter century before uh, war would arise between uh, the United States uh, and, and Spain. But those are just some examples of things that I think um, we still have to, historians need to align the standards that they use for assessing Grant's administration with those that they use to assess other administrations. And uh, when you look, uh, for instance, at um, uh, how they look at, I mentioned to you, C. Van Woodward did a study of presidential misconduct. Well, that study done during uh, the Watergate hearings was updated by James Banner, a uh, Princeton historian, uh, during the Obama administration. And it's really interesting when you look at it, how quickly historians will overlook what we might call scandal or corruption and will make the story about domestic or foreign policy. And they they still have to get more of their focus. Uh, uh, they have to get more of their act together, historians do, in assessing Grant on the basis of actual domestic and foreign policy work that he did, um, which, which really defined his uh, presidency. So I there's a, there are, I was just going to say there are some really cool essays in the book that breaks some of those things down that uh, Ryan Sams talked about Grant as a world diplomat on the world stage and Al Felsenberg's piece uh, talks about Grant and his work with civil rights and voting rights and these are always for us to really dive do a deep dive into what you're talking about. Um, one of the things that I found really fascinating too, and, and and this is something you point out in your essay, is that Grant's reputation as a president and his reputation as a general have been two different arcs. And his reputation as a general has sort of rehabilitated a little faster than his rehabilitation uh, as a president. So uh, Gary Gallagher uh, has a great essay in there that talks about that president that, uh, that 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 generalship arc, um, and you talk a bit about, about that presidential arc. So lots of different ways that we can kind of peel those peel those things uh, apart. Gary aptly names his uh, essay, The Fall and Rise of Ulysses S. Grant. It's uh, such a good way of putting what 
what happened, that really interesting trajectory. And yes, I'm so glad you mentioned our other contributors uh, to this multifaceted, rich component of Grant's public career, because this book is about 50-50 in its allocation of essays that are devoted to military versus uh, presidential. And as I mentioned earlier, there are essays that deal with other aspects of Grant's life. You know, you have uh, uh, Nick Sacco talking about uh, the family of uh, uh, Kurt Fields talking about his experience, uh, Grant, uh, being a Grant reenactor. You have John Marsalek writing about Grant at West Point from someone who's an expert on West Point and an expert on Grant and an expert on Sherman. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned Ben Kemp as well. So yeah, we have so many different aspects of Grant's life uh, covered in the span of these uh, essays. Yeah. I want to give folks to get a chance to get your questions in. So here's your chance to to type any uh, anything you want to hear from us. I'm going to hit some of the things that have been in the chat room so far. Uh, Niels asks, some have argued that Grant was successful in the Western theater largely because of the incompetence of the com uh, Confederate commanders that he faced there. What are your thoughts on this assessment? Um, I'll take a crack at that one since uh, the military history is more my bailiwick uh, when it comes to Grant. Um, I think that uh, certainly he's not up against some A-listers um, in the same way that Stonewall Jackson has success in the Shenandoah Valley because he's not up against some A-listers. But I think the thing that really helps Grant is time and distance because he's so far away from Washington. Um, he doesn't get quite the up-close attention that generals in the Eastern theater do. And that buys him the time he needs to learn from his mistakes because he does make mistakes along the way. Um, but because he's got that time and distance that kind of keeps him in the game long enough enough to learn, improve, and apply to the next thing. One of the things I admire most about Grant as a general is that he's willing to learn from his mistakes and to try again, try something new, see what he can do. And he's got the time to do that. I honestly think his biggest foe might not be any of the generals he faces out West, but instead his immediate superior, Henry Halleck, um, who is constantly working to undermine Grant anytime Grant succeeds. And most of the time, Grant doesn't know it. Um, he's singing Halleck's praises, and oh, there's nobody else besides he and McClellan that I'd like to serve under. And meanwhile, Halleck and McClellan are sharpening their knives. Um, so I think that's probably, um, um, to me, the most remarkable facet of Grant's success. Um, Frank, let me see what you have to say about this one. Also from Niels, let me scroll down here. Um, Asking about, I'm trying to find the question, but he asked about uh, Grant's reputation um, as it relates to uh, banishing the Jews from his department. And I'm trying to find the exact thing, so I'm, I'm quoting correctly, um, where um, Grant sent them out of his department later repented and had uh, you know made an effort to appoint Jews to his cabinet. Um, what are your thoughts about his overall evolution when it came to uh, to Jewish people? Yeah, that's a uh, important question. And it goes to the biggest mistake by far, I think, that Grant made in his public career. In fact, I don't know what the second biggest mistake would be, but there would be some distance between that being the first and whatever number two would be. Because uh, it really was this uh, moment uh, that's jarringly uh, inconsistent with what we see in the rest of uh, Grant's life, where he's someone who uh, shows himself to be uh, a, a very tolerant person, very embracing of a diverse range of people. Of course, General Orders Number 11 comes about during the Vicksburg campaign uh, at a time when uh, cotton trading with uh, the enemy is verboten. Now, there's, it's very tightly regulated by the uh, Treasury Department. Uh, but you have against the backdrop of an army that, of course, is afflicted with anti-Semitism, as so much of American society was at that time, you have what starts out as uh, like almost profiling, saying, well, we're we're hearing that the Jews are violating these uh, these uh, treasury regulations. And then in haste, uh, Grant fires off this uh, what, what Julia called in her memoir is that obnoxious order that says, addresses them, the Jews as a class, saying that they violated every treasury regulation addressing this issue, 
are, are, are banished. Well, Jonathan Sarna has done wonderful uh, writing on this. And for anyone who really wants to do justice to it, uh, read his uh, book that he wrote on the subject, When General Grant Expelled uh, the Jews. Um, of course, it was something that was pretty quickly countermanded by, uh, by Lincoln, and even in its short uh, shelf life, it was not implemented the way you might uh, think. They were not, in fact, looking to, uh, to eject uh, Jewish soldiers from the army or just scope out whoever they could within uh, their military department. But it's a really interesting thing, I think, that Julia, we we're talking about just what Grant thought about this, because Grant does not address it in his own memoirs. Uh, he does apologize, where he does have interviews with Jewish leaders when he's running for president. Uh, so he is on record as uh, recanting and taking, taking this back. But I find it really interesting that in Julia's memoir, the only public act of her husband's life that she is critical of in her memoir is this one, which is where that phrase, that obnoxious order comes from. And when she mentioned that he was uh, censured, they didn't actually get a censure resolution that was passed through uh, Congress. Uh, and but she's referring to rebukes that came to Grant on the part of Congress that he thought they were deservedly so. Like he thought that he actually did deserve uh, what he got on that. And by the time he's running for president and then becomes president, he is visibly beginning that process of atonement. And that process does manifest itself in making an unprecedented number of appointments of uh, Jewish uh, uh, Americans to various offices. There is a question we, we don't know. He might or might not have uh, approached Joseph Seligman to be in his cabinet as Secretary of the Treasury. We know that didn't quite happen. The first Jewish cabinet appointment would, would wait till uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but Grant em, uh, embarked on what Sarna describes. It was, it was almost a golden age for American Jewry in his description. Uh, Grant takes a stand against pogroms that were taking place in uh, Eastern Europe. He uh, appoints Benjamin Pesado, a Sephardic Jew, to be consul to, uh, to Romania, where he comes with, this is one, one of the places where pogroms are taking place, where they're very, first of all, there are discriminatory laws that uh, the Romanian government uh, is, uh, is passing, but there's also a lot of violence that accompanies it. And Pesado has a handwritten letter from President Grant saying, I'm sure you will accept him in accord and uh, give our emissary full respect as our country knows no distinction based upon uh, religion. And Pesado was then able to go to work with, with limited success, but he was able to take a strong stand that curtailed some of the worst of the abuses that happened there. Uh, and then there are points that come out I think Sarna mentioned and uh, Chernow, I think, mentioned in his biography that Grant attends the dedication of a synagogue in Washington and sits through the entire three hour service and makes a donation. These are some of them are larger gestures. Some of them are smaller gestures of atonement, but they show you uh, this is sort of Grant being able to learn from his mistakes on a, you know, the biggest example perhaps uh, comes with how uh, he reacted to uh, in the aftermath of his biggest mistake. And one interesting epilogue to the story is there uh, was an af uh, a rabbi uh, among Grant's pallbearers. There are a number of people designated Grant's pallbearers at his funeral. And one of these honorary uh, pallbearers was a rabbi uh, who was known as Alphabet Brown. Uh, uh, he was in several uh, letters, you know, uh, uh, preceding his last name. Well, he was, as far as we can tell, the last surviving Grant pallbearer. And he would make an annual pilgrimage to Grant's tomb on the anniversary of his funeral and place a wreath at Grant's tomb. And he would do that uh, well into the 20th century, we know from newspaper articles as late as 1913, maybe later than that. But that's one moving uh, epilogue, sort of a postscript to this whole uh, story of Grant and General Orders Number 11. Nils, thank you for a couple of great questions. Uh, Scott O. asks, while I was reading Chernow's biography, I noted the stylistic contrast between the written battlefield commands of Grant and, most notably, Lee. Lee. 
At the risk of overstatement, Grant's orders were direct, active voice, unambiguous, while Lee's commands were passive, indirect, and assumed that the recipient would make the correct inference. I'm curious as to your observation and opinion. Uh, Scott, I think you summed it up really well yourself, actually. Um, one of the things that's uh, most notable about Grant's writing is that it is so clear, it is so succinct, it is so direct. He knew what he wanted to say, and boom, there it was on paper. But I think that the writing styles also reflect the command styles of those two men in particular. Um, Grant was very straightforward in what he wanted to do and how he communicated his orders, where Lee tended to offer his uh, subordinates a lot of latitude and a lot of discretion. And so um, we see that certainly in the writing and, and the passive voice, uh, like, oh, I kind of want this to happen. Go figure it out. Um, that's what creates such problems, for instance, for Richard Yule and A.P. Hill at Gettysburg, because they're not used to that sort of latitude. Um, so I think that Grant's writing reflects that uh, the command style as well as the actual written style itself. So, um, Frank, any thoughts about uh, stylistically? Yeah, I, I agree entirely. And, you know, that same, that ability to write dispatches that you don't have to read them a second time to know what they're saying is a quality that also comes out in his memoirs, where he has uh, a concise, not not flowery, he avoids a lot of the verbosity uh, that characterizes a, a great deal of 19th century literature. And he winds up actually being, I think as a result, a, a better writer than so many people who made writing books their career. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And he didn't, he never, he didn't think of himself as a writer and it comes to him very late. And he's like, oh my gosh, I've been writing my whole life. Well, of course I'm a writer. <laughs> um, but, you know, it took a while for him to discover that pride of authorship. Uh, last question comes from uh, Larry. Would you discuss Grant's military decisions, which might have been hampered or helped by President Lincoln? You want to take a swing at that, Frank? Oh, hampered or helped by President hampered Lincoln. Hampered or helped. I think that uh, if you really focus on the, the period when the two of them had a relationship, uh, I would say it was th the two of them had largely the ideal relationship between a commander in chief and the commanding general of the armies, and that Lincoln really was a help uh, to to Grant, and that he did not try to micromanage. You can contrast this to you know, during Vietnam. Famously, they put you know maps of Vietnam on the desk in the White House, and you know trying to pour over. Well, this is how we should do, or that's how we should do it. Um, Lincoln needed a general that he could trust, uh, who had who shared his own strategic vision. And even though Lincoln did not have any military education to speak of, and only marginal, very brief uh, military experience, he actually had better instincts than a good number of his professionally trained Eastern commanders. You know, remember there are six commanders in the East who have a chance to get it right and they just don't quite do it. Even, you know, Meade, as talented as he is, can't quite win, you know, he can't quite forge a, a winning continental strategy. Uh, and I, I think uh, Lincoln was just, it was a great help that uh, Grant and Lincoln had that same perspective on the need to so, of course, make sure that the uh, Confederate Army was incapacitated, uh, but also uh, realizing that this would be costly, uh, being patient about it. Um, and, and if you go earlier uh, in, in Grant and Lincoln's uh, relationship, Lincoln benefited by not trying to butt in too much. Because when he heard about Grant's initial plan to invest Vicksburg after several feints over the course of many months between 1862 and early 1863. And there was this plan where Grant was going to basically cut himself off from his supply base for a period of time, cross the Mississippi, as it turns out, he would cross at a place called Bruinsburg and then make his way up indirectly, first toward the state capital of Jackson before heading west and taking Vicksburg. Well like Grant's own lieutenants, like Grant's subordinate generals, or at least most of them, um, 
Lincoln was skeptical of this, but he did not get in the way. And he wrote a very gracious letter to Grant afterwards, acknowledging that, well, you know, you were right and I was wrong. And it's to Lincoln's credit. Both men had, I think, a great deal of self-confidence in their respective spheres, but they also had humility. I mean, they both had that thing called character that could be so elusive and that we don't put enough of a premium on when we talk about leaders, when we look at leaders. But there are, you know, when you when you think about Lincoln's uh, uh, impact, you know, positive and, and negative, uh, because his instincts, uh, his judgment was so impeccable, I think even when he doesn't make the correct military call in his own mind, he has the judgment to do what a commander in chief should do, let his generals do what they are, are try to do what they uh, can do on the battlefield. And then the merit principle comes in. If you succeed, I promote you. I give you a broader command. If you fail, well, that's it. It's time for someone else to come in. Uh, now, the one thing, of course, Grant was anchored to some degree to Washington, D.C. He could not allow the defenses of Washington, D.C. to uh, be uh, to be compromised. So the, uh, and there was, of course, a point where um, uh, it was feared that uh, Lee, through, through Jubal early, might be uh, uh, able to you know, break through. But of course, they didn't come particularly close. And uh, that was not much. Uh, Grant understood the importance of uh, defending Washington, although he did interesting think if he were on the Confederate side, I think if Grant were Jefferson Davis, he would have allowed Lee to abandon Richmond much earlier because he, th he thought that Lee being anchored to Richmond, having to protect that was one of the things that shortened the lifespan of the Army of Northern Virginia. If, I, if only they had a chance to just sort of flee with the Confederate capital moving well south of Richmond, um, it would have been tougher to uh, beat the Confederacy. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Uh, the reason I pitched that over to Frank is uh, I actually have an essay in the book that talks about the interrelatedness of the moments of contingency that allow for the rise of Grant. So you can read my answer to the question uh, in the book there. Um, that's about all the time we have for tonight. I want to thank everybody for being with us and the great questions folks have chatted in our direction. Um, Kelly, uh, any administrative stuff that you need to, to wrap us up with? Just to say thank you uh, both. That was an excellent conversation. Lots of good material. Uh, makes me want to buy the book and, and read it. So it's going to be added to my list. And uh, once again, uh, thank you all uh, out there uh, who are viewing this program tonight. Uh, you can get the book from Savas Beatty and uh, get it signed by the authors, or uh, you can also order it uh, from uh, our bookshop as well. And a special thank you to those of you who are members of the museum. We do appreciate your support. And uh, Chris, Frank, this was excellent. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much for having me. Such a pleasure.